Welcome back. I'm Joshua Santora, coming to you from near the Kennedy Space Center. Today we're going to wrap up our series focused on looking at the, the challenge of getting humans into deep space and what's involved and how the world's premier spaceport, the Kennedy Space Center, is so actively involved in so much of that process. So far, we've looked at the commercial crew program and science in low Earth orbit. We looked at plotting the course to deep space and how robotic precursor missions are helping us explore, specifically Mars 2020 and the Perseverance rover, which is set to land on Mars on February 18th, 2021. Then we took a look at Gateway and how commercial partnerships are helping us get further faster. And then last time we wrapped up with the space launch system and what it takes to launch the world's most powerful rocket. Today, we're just going to skim the surface of in situ resource utilization, or ISRU, which is really a fancy term for living off of the land. Before we get to our interview with a couple scientists who are focused on a project that deals with deep space recycling, here's a word from one of our engineers, Elspeth Peterson, to explain more about ISRU and why it's so important. So in situ resource utilization, or ISRU, means using resources that aren't from Earth in order to carry out different missions. And so um, ISRU is important for a number of different reasons. Uh, one of the ones that we think about most is cost. And so when you think about taking a pound of, for example, oxygen or other things that astronauts might need um, off of the Earth, that's gonna cost thousands of dollars. And so if we can produce those resources where they're gonna be needed, such as on the moon or on Mars, then um, those are pounds that we don't have to launch from Earth saving us money. Another thing that's really important about ISRU is to have that resource available locally. And so right now we've got astronauts that have been living around the Earth in lower Earth orbit for 20 years. And we often have resupply missions that you know take a day to get it there. Um, when we talk about the Artemis project, then they're on the moon and it's gonna take much longer days to weeks to get uh, resupply missions. And so being able to produce resources where they're gonna be needed is extremely important. Oxygen extraction are two, uh, two projects that I'm working on here at Kennedy. Um, one is called Molten Regolith Electrolysis, where we actually melt the rocks on the um, moon in order to get the oxygen out of them. And the other one uses a hydrogen plasma. So I'm obviously really excited about those projects, getting oxygen on the moon um, for people, but also for propellant. Um, these kinds of ISRU plants that we're envisioning for the moon are going to create tons of oxygen per year. And so um, when you think about things at that scale, obviously it becomes much more important to be able to create it locally. Um, and then last, something that a lot of people don't think about is construction. And so building habitats for people um, here on earth, we use uh, wood and cement, that's obviously gonna be cost prohibitive to take with us. So we can use the rocks that are available on the moon and you need specialized equipment to enable to dig the rocks up and handle it because it's, the dust is very sharp. It's also very staticky and so, um, and it's very cold on the moon. And so being able to um, deal with those kinds of situations is, is going to take a really specialized group of robots in order to carry out that kind of construction work. And so that's just a few projects going on here at Kennedy Space Center. Obviously a lot of resources are gonna be needed if we're sending humans out into the solar system. And so there's a lot of ISRU projects going on across the agency. And so we're just really excited to be part of human exploration and the next man and first woman that are going to set foot on the moon and inhabit it. It is so exciting to think about in just a few short years, being able to look up at the moon and know that we have humans that are there exploring and establishing a sustained presence. Elspeth mentioned a couple different projects at work here at the Kennedy Space Center, and we're going to look at one in particular now, the Organic Processor Assembly, or OPA. Joining us are NASA's Dr. Luke Robertson, who is the principal investigator for OPA, and Dr. Daniel Yeh, professor of environmental engineering at the University of South Florida. Gentlemen, thank you for joining me. Hi, Josh. Good to be here. Let's jump right in. Uh, Luke, can you give us kind of a, a, a high level picture of what OPA is? So the OPA is our first stage of our wastewater treatment facility that we're planning to build for the moon. So as we go from low earth orbit uh, and space travel to long duration space missions, we're going to need a way to be able to transport and transfer and uh, consume all of the wastewater and be able to regenerate that for pure weight, pure water for our science needs for human consumption. 
Daniel, I know we do some of this already now in the space station. So is this really just a matter of turning that application into a use for deep space, or is there more to it? Well, right now on the uh, International Space Station, you know, NASA is doing a phenomenal job at recycling the water that's on there. So what we're aiming to do is to go to the next generation of water recycling. And in fact, we're going to go beyond water recycling and try to recycle all the elements. Uh, you know, currently fecal material isn't uh, being recycled and neither is food waste. And within them, there's valuable nutrients that we could recover to grow food. Uh, so like uh, Luke mentioned earlier, you know, as we move further away from lower Earth orbit and eventually to Mars, uh, the uh, ability to, to provide a renewable source of fertilizer is going to be really important. So you're talking about something that sounds really sustainable from the human to the ground to the plant and back to the human again. This is this is nothing human civilization has, has not been doing for, you know, tens of thousands of years, but we're just uh, trying to do this off planet. I think there's a lot of people that would be surprised if they could understand the breadth and depth of the collaborations that exist even today between NASA and academia and how mutually beneficial it is. Can you kind of summarize the value in working together? So as far as collaborations go, the diversity of thought is the most important thing. When you bring in a different perspective from a different skill set to the team, it builds the team and makes it stronger. So teaming up with Daniel in the University of South Florida with his environmental engineering background complements the chemistry and biology backgrounds that we have within the agency. Daniel, as we mentioned, you're obviously a professor, and so I would hope that you're engaging students in this process. Uh, can you talk about some of the benefits for getting students involved in real world or outer world projects? Yeah, we have a team of students uh, who are involved with this project, uh, some, you know, some of them um, only on the USF side and some of them are more active going back and forth. Uh, one example is a PhD student named Talon Bullard. And for him, you know, I mean, he's dreamed of working at NASA, working for NASA since he was a kid. But more importantly, I think he's getting some really important hands on training, uh, learning about how people at NASA think about, uh, you know, all the requirements to, to, to mission critical. It is one thing to talk about recycling. It's a whole nother thing to be able to recycle efficiently and effectively just here on Earth. It's mind blowing to think about recycling in deep space. And I'm sure it's challenging. Can you talk about some of the challenges in making OPA a reality? So the biggest challenge is balancing each and one of the element cycles that Daniel was talking about. So each element has its own uh, composition and those compositions have to be broken down from the human urine, from the human fecal matter, from humidity condensate to laundry water. And each of those different chemistries that come into our reactors have to be broken down and then isolated or uh, suspended or collected or transported or um, done something with to be able to provide a pure product at the end. Yeah, and, and, and to me, you know, a lot of this has to do with miniaturization. You know, we, we don't have the luxury of uh, having a lot of volume and, and mass uh, that we're afforded on Earth. And also there's very room, very little room for error. So we have to make something that's very compact and highly reliable. And it's going to require uh, iterations after iterations in, in the same way that, you know, we, we didn't land on the moon in one try. It took a lot of iterations and you know, it's going to require that. But fortunately, we're not starting from zero. We have a wealth of experience from you know, building similar systems on the Earth. So we, we're sure we can pull this off. Luke, I'm not sure if our viewers can tell, but on your shirt, you have a patch that pictures an, an outhouse in outer space. Uh, there's something very humorous about that image, um, but I think that there's something very indicative of what we're trying to accomplish here. Is that the real goal? That's kind of the idea. So if we have an express rack or type of modular system that we can put into the habitat, whether that's in stage one or stage four of the moon base as it's built, uh, that modular architecture will be able to uh, take in all of that wastewater, uh, turn it from a hazardous commodity to a potable drinking water, uh, all in one architecture. Luke and Daniel, uh, space toilets may not seem like very glamorous work to most people of Earth, uh, but the work that you are doing is so critical to our success in deep space. So thank you both. Uh, good luck to you and your teams going forward. Thank you, Josh. Thank you, Josh.
All right, that's going to do it for us here today. Appreciate you following along with us on this mini series, uh, unpacking the ways that the Kennedy Space Center is involved in getting humans into deep space and some of the challenges that lie ahead. Please continue to follow along with our progress uh, on social media and especially keep track of the Artemis program. Uh, we are focused on getting the first woman and next man on the surface of the moon by the year 2024. And as always, remember that even the sky isn't the limit.